All right. Thanks. Uh, my mic wasn't working, so people watching the video didn't get to hear my reminiscence of driving through a bad snowstorm. Oh, well. Um, at any rate, we're continuing our investigation of JavaScript. And one thing that's a valuable skill is to be able to look at one problem and see that one problem is really another problem just in different clothing. All right. For example, the image swap that we went over last time. Let me bring it up. The image swamp, swap, not swamp, but swap that we went over last time in class. the user puts our mouse over this. Mouse over the small image and the big image appears. And you can't see. This is sort of... I still can't see. There we go. Yeah, there we go. This is sort of the same thing as this. Whereas when you put your mouse over the different links, different stuff appears. Actually, this is sort of a combination of two things. This is a combination of that code plus code that would, instead of changing the SRC of an image, make a div appear or disappear. So real quick, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write, um, I'm going to write a, a page that has um, a couple of menus uh, that, as we mouse over it, the, the second menu appears. So let me go in and... Let me create, actually I'll copy this guy. I'll take and, and, and tweak this to work the way that I want it to. Actually, this is sort of a cross between the problem that we did in class last time and the problem that we did a couple times ago. So, for example, with this, we could have a navigation section of our page. Whoops. And we could have a couple of lists of links. So we could say something like this. We could have
you could do this a whole bunch of different ways. So I'm going to create some links here. And I'm not going to make them link to anything because that's not what I'm interested in demonstrating. And then I can put underneath this guy Submenu. And that could consist of a series of links. I'm just going to do one of these, but if we get one of them down, we'll get the rest of them down. So again, here we have this. If we were to view the HTML or view this in a browser right now with just the HTML and CSS, we have this going. Now, what we could do is do something like this. We could make sub menu A invisible. There's a couple ways to do that. We could set visibility to false, or we could say display of none. Again, the HTML and the CSS working together. The HTML has all the menus that we're ever going to see on this page, that we're ever going to need to see on this page, because that's all the content. The CSS sets the initial appearance of it, and the JavaScript then will dynamically change that appearance based on the user's action. So, now it looks like that. Now what we want to do is we want to show or hide that. So what I can do is on mouse over equals document get element by ID Submenu one style display equals block. And actually, I'm going to change this a little bit because. My brain's a little foggy this morning. Really, this shouldn't be this shouldn't be divs. This should be a UL. And this should be an LI.
And I'm going to put the submenu on the UL. So I'm going to get rid of the divs. There was an old web developer's joke, as they would say, not a joke, but a little saying, as they would, they would talk about people suffering from divitis. And that's where you put in a bunch of divs where you don't really need them because you think you need them. And I, I, the cold weather, I think, wore my resistance down, and I had a mild case of divitis this morning. Because really, this could probably be better be done with um, unordered lists. So I'll go and copy this. And dot my I's and cross my T's. And we should be in business. So let's go and look at this. All right. Now when I put my mouse over, I get that menu. Problem is it doesn't go away, right? So what do we have to do? We have to put it on mouse out. <laughs> it sure will. Or will it? Well, we'll just have to see now, won't we? My mouth's out. It does. Why does it? Well, because as soon as I take my mouse over to click on that, ha, huh, you can't. All right? It's always good to mess with your users a little bit. Nah. What do we do? We simply duplicate the on mouse over and on mouse out. Or actually, we move it. Because I want to do this if I'm anywhere over that LI. And this should take care of the issue. Problem was is that on, we, when we left the link, that caused the submenu to disappear. I'm going to put the on mouse over and on mouse out over that whole li, and that should take care of it easily. Now I can go over it, but if I go down to there, it comes out. Now, I think you can see with some tweaks, one way or another here, we could make it oriented vertically, or, or uh, horizontally rather, instead of vertically. And we could style this to make it look more like a, a real menu instead of just a, a plain old list. Uh, we can throw some of those style things in here real quick. We can say UL list style type e, uh, is none, Oops. removes a dot in front of it, right. And we can say li something like, um, what do I want to do here, background Yellow, color blue, font size 1.2M,
So if we worked on that, we could make it look like little buttons by putting some padding on it, maybe getting rid of the underline and, and things along like uh, things along that lines. All right. I actually am going way out of order today, I think. I, I was going to go back and talk a little bit about validation because that's where we left off last time. Um, but I did want to bring up the, the skill of detecting when one problem is really another problem in a different shape or form. So in other words, even though we haven't talked about mouse over menus, if you break it down and you see at, in essence what we're doing, what we did in the past two examples, if you sort of combined them, you'd end up with the ability to do mouse over menus. So that's sort of an important skill to be able to look at a problem and say, where have I done something similar to this before? How is it the same? How is it different? And then being able, being able to take and, and apply it and tweak it to, to get it to do exactly the, what, uh, what you want it to do. All right, so we are looking at validation now. And here's our form. And if you remember, we made that a required field. All right, and we made it required with an HTML5 required attribute on the form field. And that's fine for browsers to support HTML5. But as we've noticed, not all browsers support HTML5. So for example, if we run this in Internet Explorer, we change it so that we get a little alert box that pops up. Now, I'm not a big fan of alert boxes. They're sort of obtrusive. Plus, if you keep in mind that you're liable to be getting, you know, several form fields. Let's say this was a filling out a user profile for a website, and there were a half dozen web uh, fields that you had to fill in: name, address, phone number, email address, and so on down the line. If the error message pops up and says you forgot your name and phone number, and you close it. You're liable to forget. What was it I forgot again? What were the required fields? You know, you might not want to fill in all the fields unless you have to. Like, you know, if there's a form and I don't have to put my phone number in, I won't put my phone number in. And if I do have to put my phone number in, well, then I have to decide: do I really want to register for this site or not? And or do you want to give them a real, them a real phone number? Exactly. Um, and and. Uh, Again, the idea is, is that we may want to look at this. Uh, you know, we don't want to just display an error message that's going to disappear because that makes it confusing to the user. If they don't remember what the error message said, they're liable to change two of the three fields that are, that are required, click submit again, and get the error again. And that would be really annoying. So it would be better to put that error on the page. So let's look at how we can do that. So I'm going to go and edit this guy. And right now, I have sort of a long function here. I'm going to start add, and again, this gets to be very hard to read. So what I'm going to do is. In Angel, yes, yeah, it's, it's part of the uh, example for 10:25, I guess, or 11:25. All right. So what I can do instead is. Since this is getting hard to read because I have a lot of instructions, and I'm going to start adding some more instructions here, or I potentially could be adding more instructions if the form had more fields and so on, I'm going to cut it from here, and I'm going to put a script tag up in my head section that's much like a style tag. A style tag in the head section says what? It tells the browser, hey, we are no longer in HTML land. We're in CSS land. A script tag does just about the same thing, except it tells the browser, hey, you are not in HTML land. You are in JavaScript land. 
So, whatever I put within that script tag is JavaScript. Now, I'm going to create a function. And this function is called validate form. And that's a name that I just made up. It doesn't have to be validate form. I made it up. And again, it is case sensitive. So later on when I try to use this function, I'll have to try to I'll have to call it with the word validate form with this matching the case. All right. And I'm going to put my instruction in here. That's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm not even going to change the code. I'm just going to put oops the instruction in here. And to make it more readable, I'm going to put the instruction on multiple lines. All I did, in essence, was I put it in a function. I put a script tag in the head section. I wrote function, the name of the function. In other words, the name I want to give to the set of lines of code. I then put in parentheses. Then I used the curly brackets and the curly brackets there. That indicates the start and end of the function. Those curly brackets or braces group together lines of code into, into a block. So what this is saying is everything between here and here, that's my function. So that starts the function, that ends the function. Yeah, typically JavaScript statements end with, with uh, semicolons. It is forgiving, so you could leave it out and it wouldn't cause a problem in this particular case, but in other cases you do need the semicolon. So I just sort of got in the habit of putting it in. All right. Here's an if statement. An if statement is a JavaScript statement that determines whether you're going to do something or not. All right. In other words, we don't always want to display an error message. We only want to display an error message under certain circumstances. And what are those circumstances? Well, that there's nothing in the Q field on our form. So, document, we've seen that before on the web page. Get element by ID, we've seen that uh, before. In other words, find a thing on the page that has this name. Q. All right, this guy has an ID of Q. Look at his value. And if its value equals nothing, then... Does there have to be two equal signs there? Yes. All right. If the value equals nothing, then I want to do this block of code. Again, the braces indicate a block of code. And what do I want to do? I want to display my error message, and I want to return false. All right. Return false is a way of sort of saying, hey, back out of this operation. All right? So we'll see how we're going to use that in a second. Now, you asked a question about the two equal signs. You use two equal signs if you're comparing things. All right? We'll probably get into another kind of equal sign that relates to assignment, and that's when you use one equal sign. All right? If I'm comparing, if I'm asking the question, does this equal that, then I use two equal signs. And that's what I'm asking here. Does the value of the thing on the page that has an ID of Q equal nothing? That's two quotes right next to each other. There's nothing in between them. That indicates nothing. If this is true, then I'm going to do these statements. And I'm going to pop up my alert box. And I'm going to return false. And returning false is simply a way of saying, stop the presses, don't continue. Now, this just defines the function. I didn't understand that. Didn't understand what? Return false. We'll see that in a second. Okay. 
All right. Essentially, the return false is to keep the code from going and submitting the form anyhow, even though there's an error. In other words, this line of code will display the error message. This line of code will stop it from going and submitting it to the server. So those two lines, of, you, you need, in this case, you need both those lines of code. One of them will display the error message. The other one will stop it from going to the server. Yes. Uh, the, the, the parentheses be behind validate form, functions can have things called arguments. And you supply within the parentheses a list of arguments. Now, this particular function doesn't need any arguments, so there's nothing in between those. But you always have to put them in even if there's nothing in between them. All right? So we'll probably see an example of a function where we use an argument if not today, then the next week. All right. All we've done now is we've defined the function. We've said, here's a block of statements that I want to give a name. I have to invoke that function. I have to call that function. Well, when do I want to invoke it? Well, I want to invoke it when I try to submit the form. And so I'm going to say return validate form, and then parentheses. That actually calls the function. And that will use the return value of the function to cancel out the submit if there is an error. Okay, so let's see this in action and we'll, we'll come back and we'll, we'll revisit it and we'll see if there's any questions. So I can go here and I can say save and bring it up again. I click it with nothing there. Oops, that's still working. All right, I got to go in the Internet Explorer. I get the error message that says fill out the form just like before. I close that and it doesn't send it to do the search. If I type something in, I click this, and it got, does go and do the search. So, let's look at the code and see how that works. I have an onSubmit event on the form, which means that when the form gets submitted, that is, when I press the Submit button, go and do this function. Do Validate form. All right. I will come back to the return in front of it in a second, but this calls a validate form function. What does the validate form function do? Here it is. It's up here defined. And, all right, it looks to see if the thing on the page that has an ID of Q, if its value is nothing. If it's nothing, then I display my error message and I return false. The return false is what tells the submit that something went wrong here. All right. That value, then, the re this validate form function sends back a false, and the return here sort of notifies the on submit event that, hey, there's a problem. So the function says that there's a problem. That return tells the on submit event there's a problem, and that effectively cancels out the submit. So without that, we would search on Exactly. So if I get rid of this line, you can comment out a line by putting in two slashes in front of it, or in this case, I'll just delete it. So if I get rid of that line, I get my error, but it goes and tries to do the search anyhow. So, by returning the error message, or by, retur by returning a false after I've displayed the error message, that tells, that sort of notifies this on submit event that, hey, there's a problem. I then have to do one more return to tell the on submit event 
that there's a problem. All right. So this returns a false. This passes on that false to the onSubmit event. In fact, if I leave that off, if I leave that return off, then we're in the same boat. Whoops. And then it goes and does the submit. But if the function returns a true or false, and then that true or false is passed to the onSubmit event, that can cancel out a form being submitted. All right. So now we're, no really, we're not really any better off than we were last time. All right? We've just cleaned up our code a little bit to make it more easy to read. All right? If you remember before, that code was smack dab in the middle of our HTML attribute, which made the code sort of hard to read. You know, that extended way out here. This is much more concise, and we can sort of get our heads around it. This also gives us the ability to ignore that, all right? Um, if I'm not interested in the validation, if I'm interested in something else about the form, well, that's simple enough to ignore. It doesn't get my way. It's just a, a few characters. If I am interested in it, I can go up and I can look at it. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this so that it doesn't display an alert. It's going to display an error message right underneath this. So let's say I'll put a label here. If you remember for accessibility. Probably should have a label here. I'm going to put down here in a paragraph with an ID of error messages. I'm going to put a blank paragraph there. All right. Why am I putting a blank paragraph there? Well, this is some place for me to put error messages should there be any problem. Especially if you consider the fact that there could be multiple fields on a form and I could have several problems. So it might turn out to be a paragraph. Excuse me. So I'm going to clean this up a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I want to point to that paragraph and put an error message there. How do I point to that paragraph? I can say document dot get element by ID Q. Oh, it's not Q, it's error messages, right? And I want to change something about it. What do I want to change about this? Well, it's almost like I want to go in there and type some words between the start and end tag. I want to type, hey, you forgot to enter in a search term. All right. How do you tell the browser to do that? Well, that property between the start and end tag is called the inner HTML attribute. And I can say, find a thing on the page that has this ID, error messages, and put in the inner HTML, that is, put here some text. So what text do I want to put? Please enter a search term. And then I can return false just like I did before. And the only difference will be instead of having an error message pop up that's going to disappear when I click OK, this will write 
on the page an error message. So let's go to Internet Explorer again and refresh this guy. Please enter a search term. All right. Now, that doesn't really stand out that much, right? So what could I do to make that error message stand out? Exactly. And how do I do that? Via the style. So I could go in here and I could say style and I could say the thing that has an ID of error messages I want it to have big font. So font size 1.3 M font weight bold color red now we know that just making it red isn't a good idea by itself right because there's people that are colorblind and that won't stand out but if I make it red and make it bigger and make it bold then it'll stand out for even people that can't distinguish red. I think colorblind people would perceive red as black as white background. Well, they'd see it, right, but it wouldn't be emphasized. In other words, it would be black, it would be dark text just like everything else is dark text. They might see it as like a dark gray or they might see it as some shade of gray or black. But it wouldn't stand out because the rest of the type is, is black. But if we make it bold and bigger and red, then people that can't see red, it will be emphasized two ways, by the size and by the font weight. For people that aren't colorblind, they get all three visual cues. Oh, but we don't want to do that. We don't want to make it flash on and off because, uh, again, um, that kind of screen flashing and animation can distract people um, and it can actually trigger seizures. So I, I wouldn't, oops. <laughs> yeah. Right, and, and, and right, among other things. All right, so hey, that stands out pretty good. Oh, that's all right. So that stands out pretty good. Now, what could we do to maybe even make this stand out more? What happens, for example, if there were a whole bunch of, uh, of things? We might actually change this to be a different color or to be bigger or whatever. So what I could do is, if there's a problem, I could find the label. and set some attribute of the label. So I could set oops, style, font, weight, equals bold No, it would take two lines of code. One to change the one attribute, one to change the other. Oh, 
ooh, something bad happened. I broke it. Now, I immediately see the answer. But if you do, no spoilers. Don't say. So what do I want to do? Well, I want to debug this. Chrome is typically better for debugging than Internet Explorer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off that required attribute, and I'm going to view this page in Chrome. And I click Search Bing, and ooh, it goes and searches anyhow. This actually is going to be, actually I'm going to debug this one in Firefox if we have Firefox installed. Or actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to fake it not to submitting. Because the problem is, is I get the error and it submits it. I'm going to fake it into not submitting it real quick. Because I want to show you something in if I go here and go to Tools, JavaScript Console. Oh, I'm not calling the function. Ah, shucks. It's a lot of work just to demonstrate a point. I'll move the on click, make this an on click event down here. I get an error. Invalid left side in assignment on line 12. And that will show me line 12 says, get element by ID Q label equals that. It's telling me that this is not legal, the left side. Why is it not legal? Well, I call it label Q, not Q label. So let me go and change it to label Q. Let me make this a submit button again. What I really wanted to show you is, is viewing the JavaScript console and how that works and is best viewed either in Firefox or Chrome. So now I'll go in, set everything back to where it was, view this in Internet Explorer, and still get the error. Did I? I put I put required back in. If Q value equals that. Ah, it's not font weight. It's remember when there's a dash, it becomes font weight like that. And there it goes and does it like that. All right, I'll post these examples up, and next week we'll have some more fun with this stuff. All right, see you up in lab.